Well, good morning and welcome to Mount Pisgah Baptist Church. Let's stand together as we worship. How many know he's worthy of our worship this morning? Amen. It is good to see you in the house of God this morning. Thank you so much for being here. It's always an exciting day when we get a chance to see those that have been saved by God's grace come through the baptismal waters. Uh, what a wonderful, wonderful day that it is. We had four baptized at the first service. We've got eight, I believe, that uh, will be baptized in this service. And I don't know about you, but I don't ever want it to get old. I don't want it to get old that we see those that come to faith in Jesus Christ and then want to take their Next step of obedience in believer's baptism. And so we celebrate today. I don't ever want this ordinance to go by without talking about the significance of the waters of baptism. Now, those that will come today have already been saved by God's amazing grace. They've already repented of sin and placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Their name's already been written down in the Lamb's book of life. You see, this water has no saving power at all. But these that come today are taking a step of obedience in their walk with Jesus. 
and they are shouting to those that are on looking today that they have been saved by the amazing grace of God. And so today we celebrate with them as we observe believers' baptism. All right, first we got, I got two nieces being baptized today. So come on, sweet girl. Kenley, upon your profession of faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and now in obedience to his command, I baptize thee, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Come on, Charlie. This is Charlie. We call her Charlie Joe. Charlie, upon your profession of faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. We have Kayla Thompson. Kayla got saved here a few weeks ago. Comes forward for believers' baptism today. We celebrate with her. Sit right on the edge of that. So, Kayla, upon your profession of faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and now in obedience to His command, I baptize thee, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Next, we have Gage. Amen, Gage. Gage, upon your profession of faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and now in obedience to his command, I baptize thee, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. Right in the middle here, we have something a little, a little different, but very special today. Uh, Derek Longnecker, many of you know him, was saved just a couple of weeks ago here at the church, and his dad is the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Six Mile, and uh, his dad is here this morning to baptize his son, and I just think it's awesome, amen? So Brother Ray, you come on, brother. Good morning, Mount Pisgah. I'd like to thank Brother Chad for the privilege and the honor of allowing me to baptize my son. That means all my children are in and all but a couple of my grandchildren, and I praise the Lord for that. Thank you. Isn't that good? Praise the Lord. He's good. All right, Cody, we got next. Cody McAllister. I know what some of y'all are thinking. You're thinking, Pastor, I bet you're glad y'all have one where they can sit down now because if you had to stand up and Baptize this old boy right here. He like would take you with him. <laughs> it's a wonderful day when he realized he was lost in need of a Savior. And I praise the Lord. Cody, upon your profession of faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, now in obedience to his command, I baptize thee, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ, 
raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Next we have Ty. Tie upon your profession of faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and on obedience to his command, I baptize thee, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. The last baptismal candidate for today, Sean Robertson. I had a conversation with Sean's dad on Friday. I think it was Friday. Right there. There you go. His father and I went to middle school together. He's sitting right over here somewhere. I can't see anymore. But uh, um, he said, Chad, did you ever think when we were in middle school that you would baptize my son? He said, it's not that I'm surprised that my son's being baptized. I'm surprised you're a preacher. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all are. <laughs> Sean, upon your profession of faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and in obedience to his command, I baptize thee, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Would you pray with me, church? Heavenly Father, thank you today for what our eyes have already seen, Heavenly Father, for what our ears have already heard. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for salvation. And I pray, Lord, if there are others here today that need to make a decision for you, Lord, they need to take their next step of baptism. Lord, I pray today they would come forward. Lord, that we would have an opportunity to share with them about this act of obedience, this step of obedience in their walk with you. Lord, if there are those unsaved today, I pray you'd save them. And Lord, I thank you, Heavenly Father, for the rescue story that is mine. That Lord, I was rescued from sin, self, and Satan. Lord, there's so many in here this morning that have a rescue story. And Lord, as the praise band and praise team shares with us this morning about a rescue story, Lord, would you remind us of our rescue story as they sing? And then as they sing, Lord, I pray we would worship, thanking you, Heavenly Father, for how you rescue us from an eternity separated from you to a place called heaven to be with you forever. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this morning. And I pray, God, you would speak in a supernatural way to the hearts of your people this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
story. Amen. I want to say thank you for being here. It looks absolutely wonderful on a Sunday morning. Thank you for being in your place. Listen, I know the tendency maybe is to be a little down on the Sunday after Easter, but I want you to know he's just as alive today as he was last Sunday. Amen. He's alive and alive forevermore. And so I want to say thank you for being here this morning. I want to also say to our online audience, many of you have texted and said, hey, Pastor, we're out of town, we're traveling, and we just want to tell you that we'll be watching via live stream. Let me say thank you for watching live stream. We appreciate that so much, and I'm glad you are here. Let me make just a quick announcement. First of all, tomorrow morning, our prime timers are heading up to the Cove uh, uh, in Asheville leaving here at 7.45 in the morning. So be here at 7.45 in the morning, prime timers that are heading out. Then Thursday at 10.30 in the morning and 6.30 in the evening to be our final night of our men's spring Bible study. Been a wonderful time with Pastor Hayden as we walk through the life of Jonathan. And if you've missed the first three weeks, listen, you come on, I promise you, you'll gain something out of being here on Thursday, either at 10.30 a.m. or 6.30 p.m. I also want to invite you to next weekend. Next weekend is really one of the biggest weekends of the year for our church. It's our missions conference. And starting next Saturday night at 6 o'clock, we'll have our first uh, session next Saturday night at 6 o'clock. We're going to have a full-blown service with some of our missionaries being here. And then our missionaries will be in your grow groups on Sunday morning, and then they'll be sharing next Sunday as well. So we are very excited about that. But here's what I need you to do. Next Saturday night, at what time? Six o'clock. All right, we're going to do that again because four of us got it. Next Saturday night, at what time? Six o'clock. We're going to be right here. There's no greater thing that you can do next Saturday night at six o'clock than to come here and be an encouragement to those missionaries that we support every single month. Yes, we send money to the cooperative program. We also have some Faith Promise missionaries that we support. And our Faith Promise missionaries are going to be here. And just about all of them that we support are going to be here. They've given up everything to go across the seas to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I want you to come. And I want us as a church to be a great encouragement to our missionaries next weekend. So I don't know if you've caught on to this or not, but I'd really like for you to be here next Saturday night. At what time? Praise the Lord. It's my prayer that through song and through sermon this morning, God will speak to your heart in a powerful, powerful way. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your presence in this place today. Thank you, Lord, for what we've already seen. What an absolute blessing it is, Lord, to see those come through the baptismal waters. And God, I do pray that as we continue worship, Lord, we would focus wholly upon you. Lord, we would turn all of our attention upon the one who gave his life for us on the cross of Calvary. But three days later, 
rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Lord, we want to focus on you this morning. May we worship you in spirit and in truth. For it is in the name above all names we pray, the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand to our feet and worship, church. day we'll stand in his very presence and sing holy 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 is the Lord God Almighty let's sing that this morning to him
Heavenly Father, thank you for the reminder today that you are holy. And Lord, you are coming. Lord, you were, you are, and you forever will be. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the promise in Scripture that you are coming again. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that everybody on the sound of my voice this morning is prepared, Heavenly Father, for that day. And Lord, if they're not, I pray today would be the glad day. They'd come to know you as Savior and Lord. Thank you, Lord, for our hearts have been prepared to hear your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If you've got your Bibles, I want to invite you to find the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3. And while you're finding your place in Galatians, I just want to remind you that our offering plates are there at the doors as you go out. Many of you have been faithful to give online, and we want to say thank you. You guys have been super-duper faithful in your giving, and we just want to encourage you to continue uh, our renovations on our preschool area over there to give them a little bit more space started this past week. So that will give us some temporary relief on that preschool hallway, but we believe in the days ahead God's got something bigger for us uh, to do specific to our children, and we hope in the days to come to be able to share that with you, and I am excited about what God is doing here, and I hope that you are too, and I want you to get in on what God is doing. We often make our plans, and we ask God to get in on what we're doing. I'd say that we got that exactly backwards. We ought to just find out what God's doing and go get in on what he's doing. Amen? Good to see you in the house of God this morning. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. We have been walking through the book of Galatians, and we took a little bit of a break during uh, Easter and a couple of weeks before Easter, but we've been preaching through a series called Delivered. Delivered. Paul is writing to these Galatian believers, and they had begun to absorb some of the teaching of the Judaizers. Now, what was the teaching of the Judaizers? The Judaizers were teaching that grace was okay, but in order for somebody to be saved, they needed to also observe the law, the Mosaic law. They needed to adhere to the kosher diet. They needed to observe the act of circumcision. They needed to observe all of the ceremonial law. And Paul had established these churches in the regions of Galatia, and there were a bunch of Gentile converts. But these Judaizers came into these new converts, and they were confusing them about what grace really was about. Paul, even in chapter 1, says, I am absolutely astonished. The King James says that I marvel that you are so soon removed from the truth which I taught you to another gospel. And Paul is concerned about the false teaching of the Judaizers. And he writes this letter to the churches at Galatia to try to straighten out some of the teaching of these Judaizers. He wants to ensure them that both salvation and sanctification are both a work of God apart from the law. Paul continues by telling them that they can either be cursed by the law or cleansed by the Lord. And that'll be our title for today, cursed or cleansed. We could even say ruined or redeemed. And Paul is going to make very clear that salvation has nothing to do with you, but everything to do with the Lord. So let's stand together and read Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse 6. If you're there, say amen. amen. Keep your Bibles open with me this morning. We're going to walk verse by verse through this, and it is our practice here to just pick a book of the Bible and walk through it. And I pray that God would speak to you through his word this morning. Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. 
And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Heavenly Father, speak to us through the preaching of your word this morning. Challenge us and change us by the power of God. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Remember when Paul and Silas were there in the Philippian jail, and the Bible says at midnight they began to pray, and they began to praise, and the walls came down in that prison cell. And the, and the Philippian jailer assumed that everyone had run out. And the Philippian jailer comes running in to Paul and Silas, and he asks a question. And here's his question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul answers that very clearly when he says, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. One preacher said it this way. Salvation is by grace through faith. It is personal, internal, spiritual, having nothing to do with ceremonies, rituals, observances, or good works of any kind. You can't be good enough to earn favor with God. Now, we've been, we, we live in a selfie society where everybody's all about self-value and self-esteem, and I'm here to tell you, there is nothing good in self because self cannot get to God without the grace of God because there's nothing you can do. But I'm a good person. Good people are going to wind up separated from God for all eternity. I treat people well. Hey, I didn't even cheat on my taxes this year. <laughs> good people do not make it to heaven by their good works. And here's what's happening in Galatia. The Judaizers are twisting the scriptures for their good and for their agenda. The Judaizers have taken the Old Testament and they have taken their go-to man, Abraham, and they have twisted the scriptures to fit their agenda. Hear me and hear me well. We've seen the scriptures be twisted from the very beginning. Go with me to the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve were. And the serpent came in and said this, Did God really say? Did, is that really what God said? You see, the word of God's being twisted, especially in evangelical America, to make people comfortable with their sin. Because we want God to be comfortable with our sin, but uncomfortable with everybody else's sin. So we've just created a God in our own image, twisted the scripture to something that we are comfortable with, and so we're just good with it. I, I, I hesitate to even go where I'm about to go in my notes because I know where the culture is now, but I just decided I'm not concerned about the culture, Jeremy. I, I'm just not. I'm concerned about the culture's eternity I'm not concerned to what the culture thinks about this Baptist preacher. Nobody has twisted the scriptures like modern America has. Probably 50 of you sent me a text yesterday with a picture of a church that is having drag me to church day. They're going to have drag queens come to the church 
dressed up like drag queens. I don't want to say what I'm thinking. Because, see, man is horrible, and I am too, okay? Drag me to church today. You say, Pastor, that's all the way out in Los Angeles. No, it's in Greenville, South Carolina. I want you to hear my heart. No group has twisted the scriptures more than the LGBTQIA plus group. Some of you just got real uncomfortable, and I'm going to tell you why. Because a preacher can stand flat-footed and preach against greed, and everybody's good with that. A preacher can stand flat-footed and preach against drunkenness, and everybody's good with that. A preacher can stand flat-footed and preach against lying, and everybody's good with that. A preacher can stand flat-footed and preach against sin, 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 and everybody's good with it. But as soon as I begin to preach that the LGBTQIA plus movement is wicked and is sinful, everybody gets a little nervous, and here's why. Because the culture has told you you're not compassionate if you call sin, sin. And I'm here to tell you, it's time for the church of God to say, I'm not going to stand by and allow the scriptures to be twisted into something that it is not. Well... I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> but I can't twist the Scripture into something I'm comfortable with. The Scripture says what the Scripture means. And it's been going on for a long time. The Judaizers were doing it to these brand new converts. And these converts were getting confused you see how converts, early, young converts can get confused by somebody twisting Scripture? Me and Brandon Bailey were talking this past week, and we talked about how we don't have our kids for very long. And we better get them grounded in the Word. We better make sure they know what the Word teaches because, listen, there is some twisting going on. I could stay there the rest of the day, but let's, let's get into our outline. I want to preach this to you. Notice with me, first of all, the pathway of salvation. The pathway of salvation. Paul's going to ensure that these young Judaizers understand, or these young converts, that they understand that the Judaizers are twisting the Scriptures. And he's going to teach them that salvation has always been by faith. Whether it's looking forward to the promise of God, looking back to the promises of God, one of the Judaizers' favorite people, their go-to man was always Abraham, right? And so let's notice a couple of things about Abraham. Notice, first of all, Abraham's faith. How did Abraham come to faith? Was it by being a good Jew? Was that counted to him as righteousness? Was it counted to him as righteousness because he was circumcised? So then how was he saved? Paul's going to quote, he quotes right here, Genesis 15, and says that Abraham believed and it was counted him for righteousness. Here's what that means is Abraham believed God and accepted his word. He trusted the promises of God. Listen, just believing in the existence of God is not enough. Listen, the devils believe and they tremble. We must believe what he says, put our faith and trust in him and him alone. Abraham believed in God, not in himself, not in his circumcision and not in his keeping of the law. You say, pastor, how can you say that? Well, listen to me. The law that God gave Moses didn't come until 430 years after God declared Abraham righteous. So it couldn't have been the law. Oh, it was his circumcision. Nope. Abraham was declared righteous and was not circumcised for 14 years later. So it wasn't his doing that caused him to be made right with God. It was his believing. 
and he put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. His circumcision was a mark of salvation, not a means of salvation. Just like our good works. For those of you that are saved and you do good works, those things are marks of your salvation, not a means by which you receive salvation. So Paul uses scriptures to clarify Abraham's faith. So we see Abraham's faith, but then notice with me Abraham's family. Look at verse 7. Know you therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Now, watch this now. That you that are of the faith, you're children of Abraham too. The Judaizers would have just, I mean, they, this would have blown their, this would have blown their minds. Right? So Paul's saying since it was Abraham's faith that brought righteousness and not works, it's logical then to understand that anybody who comes to faith is a son of Abraham, Jew or Gentile. How many of you went to VBS when you was a kid? All right, you ready? Sing with me. Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had... Right arm, Father Abraham, left arm, right? There's truth in what we were singing as kids. That when we came to faith in Christ, we were, we were in that same line. The Judaizers love to use Abraham as an example, but as, as, a, as a means to convince people to observe the law. But Paul says, listen, Abraham wasn't justified by the law. He believed. Notice verse 8 with me. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. What did the scriptures foresee? It says the scriptures are foreseeing something. That God's going to justify the lost through faith. And he says it's going to happen through Abraham. You remember the promise God made to Abraham? It was a personal promise. He said, in thee, in you, Abraham, are all nations going to be blessed. But Abraham and I, and our Abraham and Sarah didn't have a baby yet. And Abraham's a hundo. That's a hundred for you older folks. <laughs> he, he was a hundred years old. Sarah is 90. So how is this promise to Abraham going to be fulfilled? Through a miracle of God. Sarah becomes pregnant at 90 years of age and has the promised child Isaac. It was a personal promise, but then Abraham experiences a betrayed promise. Here's the, here's the promised child Isaac, right? And God says, you need to sacrifice him, Abraham. Kill him. Jeremy, what's interesting to me about that is I don't ever see where Abraham and God got in an argument about that. I don't ever see where Isaac argued with daddy as they were making their way up Mount Moriah where Isaac says, hey, I see the, I see the wood and the fire. Where, where's the sacrifice? And they're walking up that mountain and in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 8, Abraham says this, my son... God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they both went together. Listen, he said he would provide himself a lamb, not with a lamb, but provide himself a lamb. A Abraham saw something right there on Mount Moriah. And Jesus is speaking, I love this, in John chapter 8. This is in red letters in your Bible. John chapter 8, verse 56. Here's what Jesus said. Your father Abraham, he rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Listen, Abraham didn't have some vision, have some faint spell, and fall out speaking in tongues. He just believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. You say, how do I get in? The same way, amen? You just believe the promise of God that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There's the pathway of salvation. I gotta hurry. There's the pronouncement of scripture. 
So we've already talked about the Judaizers, man. They advocated that a person must observe the Mosaic law if they're truly going to be saved. And man, here's these new converts, these newly converted Gentiles, man, and they're in danger of embracing this teaching. And so there's the pronouncement of the Scriptures. First of all, it speaks of a curse. It speaks of a curse. Look at verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. I don't have time to get all the way into this, but let me just say this. So these Judaizers have convinced these Gentiles to be enamored with the law. And they've said, you got to keep the law if you're going to be saved. I wonder if they told them the whole story. Because the whole story is this. You have to keep, if you're going to mix this in as a means by which you receive salvation, your good works and keeping the law, you got to keep every jot and every tittle of it. You cannot break not one law. And if you break one law, you are separated forever. And you are cursed if you break one law. Notice, notice verse 10, it says it right there. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in what? All things. You got to obey every single part of the law or you are guilty of absolutely all of it. You know what God's, perf God's standard is? Perfection. So if you mess up once, you're done. So let me ask you a question. How many of you broke the speed limit on the way to church this morning? You're going to hell. <laughs> you broke the law. I said, you're done. I mean, you're done. Now, how fair would, I mean, how, how good would that be? <laughs> Talk about needing a rescue story. But that's what Paul is making these Gentile believers understand. Look, and, and the Jews are in a terrible place because think about this with me. Think about this with me. So the Jews are saying, you got to keep every bit of it. And they're putting expectations on the Gentiles that they themselves don't live up to. Hello. Jack Andrews, a friend of mine, wrote a commentary on this and he said this. If you commence in the law, you must continue in the law. And if you do not continue in the law, you are cursed by the law. Because verse 10 of chapter 3 says, Cursed is everyone that continues not in all things. What does that mean? That means you and I are under a curse. We can't keep the law. The law was used as a schoolmaster, as a mirror for us to look into and understand that we cannot meet God's standard. David Jeremiah said it this way, the Judaizers found themselves in an awful spot. They couldn't live up to God's law, yet they wanted everybody else to submit to it. <laughs> so it speaks of a cure. It speaks of a contrast. Verse 11, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall what? Live by what? The just shall live by faith. Now, if you study this, you're going to find this, this verse occurs three times in the New Testament, but it's also in the Old Testament. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4 says, The just shall live by faith. So, what was going on in Habakkuk's day? And what is it that Paul's trying to teach them by quoting this verse? I love this. So, the southern kingdom of Judah was evil to the core. They had, they had forsaken the Lord. They had embraced idolatry. They were embracing paganism, man. And they were a horrible, horrible people. And Habakkuk goes to the Lord and says, Lord, are you going to redeem these people? Are you going to draw them back to you? And Habakkuk even suggests that the Lord's being indifferent, that the Lord won't answer. And Habakkuk even says this at one time, how long, Lord, how long are you going to let this go before you get the people's attention? Are you ever going to speak? And God says, well, Habakkuk, I'm about to speak, but you ain't going to like what I'm about to tell you. He says the Babylonians are coming in, and the Babylonians are going to destroy the temple. The Babylonians are going to wear you out. 
and they are going to take you into captivity. You're going to be in captivity for 70 years. They're going to wear you out. And Habakkuk says, whoa, wait a minute. You're talking about the evil Babylonians? And God said, yeah, I'm talking about the evil Babylonians. He said, now, wait a minute, God. We're evil, but we ain't as evil as they are. And you're going to use them to get our attention? And God said, yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to do. So then what is God trying to teach Habakkuk? Trust me, because the just shall live by faith, so that even when it doesn't make sense to you, even when it doesn't seem to add up, you must live by faith, knowing everything is working for your good and for his glory. It speaks of a contrast. Listen to me. You remember Martin Luther, the reformer, Catholic who tried to earn his salvation by his own works? He learned that it's not the law that brings salvation, it's the Lord. He was zealous about his Bible study, prayed and fasted until he was a skeleton almost. He did penance. He went on pilgrimages. He was so ritualistic in his prayers until one day God thundered a message into his soul that said this, the just shall live by faith. And he marched out of the church of Rome and into a true relationship with the Almighty. Listen, it's either works or the word. It's either the law or the Lord. And Paul says, listen to me, it's not about days, it's not about diets, and it's not about doing. It's about what Jesus Christ has already done. It speaks of a curse. It speaks of a contrast. And then finally, it speaks of a conclusion. Verse 12. I'll give you this real fast. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. So here's the conclusion. The law continues to say do. So you get up in the morning, and you think somehow you're earning favor with the Lord by the good things that you do. You see, I have my prayer time this morning. The motivation behind that prayer time should be the desire to fellowship with the Lord, not to try to earn brownie points with the Lord. There's no gold stars over in heaven. You're not going to get there, and you're going to have all these gold stars because you read your Bible every morning, and, you, uh, and, and God's giving out all these gold stars, and Moses is going to be there and go, man, look at all them gold stars you have. Will you sign my Bible? We should have prayer time every day. We should have time in the Word every day, but not because we are trying to earn favor with God, but because it is the outflow of our love for Him and Him living His life through us. There's the pathway of salvation. There's the pronouncement of the Scriptures. And then finally, in verses 13 and 14, there's the provision of the Lord. The Lord knew Listen, the Lord knew we could never match up to this. We, we, we could never live up to the standard that he's put in place. We can never live a life of perfection that is demanded. And because he knew we couldn't meet the requirement of perfection, he made provision for us. First of all, we have been redeemed. Look at verse 13. Christ has what? redeemed us. We could take the rest of the time and run around and shout a little while that we've been redeemed. We've been purchased. Paid for. He desired relationship with us so he sent his son and he purchased us. And he was the only one that could pay that price. First Peter chapter 1 says, For as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. See, there had to be perfection. So the perfect one came. Give me one minute to deal with this. Verse 13, he's redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. I think those two words, for us, might be as powerful as any in this entire book. He was made a curse 
for us. For it is written, here's Paul going back to the word of God again, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. In ancient Judaism, a criminal was usually executed by stoning and then they would tie them up to a post or a tree where his body would hang until sunset. It was a visible representation of the rejection of God. But that one who had transgressed the law was not cursed because he hung on a tree. He hung on a tree because he was cursed. So Jesus hung on a tree. Because he was cursed with the curse that you and I deserved. He took our place in what this song says is a divine exchange. Have you experienced that divine exchange? Are you trying, trying, trying? It's time to start trusting, trusting, trusting. You see, our Lord experienced separation that we might experience salvation. He experienced death that you and I might be delivered. He paid the penalty so that you and I might be pardoned. And he became a curse that you and I might become a child of God. You here today? And you don't know heaven is your final home? Man, I want you to know that Jesus Christ loves you, brought you here today. And there's a divine appointment today. And Jesus says to you, I love you. And I went to the cross for you. I redeemed you. And you can come into a relationship with Jesus Christ today, not by doing good stuff, but by surrendering to his will and saying, Lord, I can't, but you can. Lord, I'm not worthy of your sacrifice, but Lord, I thank you that you gave your life for me on the cross of Calvary. So if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, in just a moment, we're going to stand to our feet. I want you to come forward, put your hand in mine and say, Pastor, I need to be saved. We'll take the word of God and show you how you can leave today knowing heaven's your home. Could be some of you have friends, loved ones, neighbors, co-workers. You know they're unsaved. Man, maybe you want to find a spot in an altar and lift their name up before the Lord. Could be that you need to take your next step of faith in believer's baptism. You made a profession as a young child, but later in life, you truly got saved. You truly got born again. And your baptism's on the wrong side of your conversion. Why not today? Come forward and make that decision. Maybe this is the church God would have you to yoke up with, but whatsoever he says unto you, do it. Could be that you want to find a spot in an altar and just say, Lord, I'm glad I don't have to do it to earn favor with you because, Lord, you've already done all the work. And, Lord, help me to rest in that. As we stand to our feet, James is going to lead us. You sing. You come do business with the Lord.